President of the United States, Dwight D. Eisenhower, who spoke this evening from his office in the White House. Good evening, everybody. This is Douglas Edwards. As you just heard, President Eisenhower, in his last good night to the American people as president, cautioned against two threats to our democracy. The first threat he defined as unwarranted influence by an immense military establishment and a vast armaments industry, whether sought or unsought. And he also cautioned against letting public policy become the captive of a scientific and technological elite. He said that while we must respect scientific research and development, like the military, the influence of the scientific must be molded and balanced within the democratic system. The president combined prayerful words for his successor with a warning that the struggle with communism will be long and not subject to any miraculous solution. He said he would never cease to do what little I can to achieve peace and disarmament with mutual honor and confidence. Mr. Eisenhower spoke from a White House office already stripped of most of his personal belongings, including his oil paintings. Tomorrow, he'll hold a farewell news conference. On Thursday, he will discuss transition problems for the second time with President-elect John Kennedy. On Friday, he will attend the inauguration services, and shortly after lunch, he will leave with Mrs. Eisenhower for Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, a private citizen completing 50 years of national service. On this night that the outgoing president assessed the world situation and the nation awaited the words of his successor, Moscow chose to make public a document as important as any issued by the Soviets in the post-war period. It was Premier Khrushchev's official interpretation of the manifesto issued by the communist summit meeting called to resolve the ideological conflict between the hard war being inevitable, that's the inevitable line of the Chinese communists, with a soft, peaceful coexistence approach of the Soviets. Said Khrushchev in briefing Russian party organizations, war is not necessary, that is, not atomic war and not brush fire wars such as the war in Korea. No mention, however, of Laos. Khrushchev did, however, go on fully to approve a third class of war, what he called the War of Liberation. He called the Algerian Rebellion a sacred war, and he added, we have helped and shall go on helping people fighting for their freedom. The Soviet premier predicted that a victory by communism is not far off, and here he warned that war could come if the capitalist nations resist what is historically inevitable, according to him. He defined peaceful coexistence as an intense struggle by economic, political, and ideological means, and said it is one means of preventing a military conflict with capitalism. Another means he described as the development of peace fronts throughout the world, including pacifists of all political beliefs. Further evidence that the Russians will try to upstage President-elect Kennedy with a spectacular space shot this week has been provided by the Navy. A fourth Soviet range ship has been spotted moving into position in the Pacific. And like the three previously reported vessels, this one carries helicopters, which of course could be used to recover either a missile nose cone or a space capsule. For some time, there's been speculation that the Russians are trying to time a man in space effort to obscure the inauguration here. Mr. Kennedy is back in Washington tonight, attending a gala family party and otherwise making final preparations for his role in the inauguration day ceremonies on Friday. But looking beyond Friday, Republicans are already throwing challenges onto the floor of Congress. Two Republican senators, both from New York State, introduced a seven-point civil rights program today. Senators Javits and Keating of New York then issued a statement urging President-elect Kennedy to back the program and otherwise take the initiative in civil rights cases. One of their colleagues, Senator Cooper of Kentucky, also introduced a civil rights bill. It would permit the Attorney General to intervene in school desegregation cases brought to courts by individuals. The retiring Republican Attorney General, William Rogers, held a farewell news conference in Washington today and he predicted that civil rights was probably one of the most active of all problems facing his successor, Robert Kennedy. The key question for Rogers today, however, was his view of events at the University of Georgia. Mr. Rogers, are you satisfied with the progress at the University of Georgia? Well, uh, of course, uh, I'm gratified and pleased that the events of the last couple of days have worked out so well. I think uh, all Americans are uh, uh, were very disappointed and sad at uh, the events that preceded that. 
I would hope that the events of the last few days would indicate that uh, the uh, persons concerned will comply with a decision of the court because it certainly is a, a national interest that that happen. Mr. Attorney General, would you favor the Civil Rights Commission proposal to cut off federal funds to state-operated colleges and universities if they don't agree to desegregation? Yes, generally speaking, I think that uh, the government of the United States should not directly contribute to uh, education in a, uh, for an institution that does not comply with the decision of the Supreme Court. So generally speaking, I would favor that. On the University of Georgia campus at Athens, the two Negro students whose presence resulted in those riots last week attended classes without incident today. At the same time, six Ku Klux Klansmen arrested during the melee were bound over for grand jury action on charges of carrying weapons to a public gathering. Well, back in Congress on the House side, Speaker Sam Rayburn has received solid backing from self-described liberal Democrats for his plan to enlarge membership of the Rules Committee. Rayburn plans to expand the committee, a roadblock for much liberal legislation from 12 to 15 members. Of the three new members, two would be liberal Democrats, the third a Republican, thereby breaking up the Republican Southern Democrat coalition which has run the committee in the past. The Rayburn plan goes to a House Democratic caucus tomorrow. Well, coincident with Kennedy's return to Washington was the release of a Senate Commerce Committee report, which urges a new look at trade restrictions on red China. The new look, however, should be within the context of prevailing foreign policy considerations towards the Beiping regime. The Beiping regime and the United States' attitude towards it was the subject of a Senate speech by Senator Norris Cotton, Republican of New Hampshire. Cotton challenges Chester Bowles' avowal of a two-China policy and says that if he feels that way, then Bowles should not be confirmed American Undersecretary of State. The statement may very well be the first shot of a prolonged congressional battle over approval of Bowles' nomination. Well, there's no controversy in Great Britain, however, about any of Mr. Kennedy's cabinet and other top-level appointments so far. CBS News correspondent Dan Shore discovered the general air of approval in an interview with Labor Party leader Hugh Gateskill, who is now in New York City. I think myself, and I believe this is the general feeling in Britain, that he's picked a very strong team. Uh, I happen to know personally a number of them, and uh, all of them men of very, very great ability, uh, energetic, reasonably young uh, and well-informed. And I think that the reaction in Britain to uh, his uh, government, to his administration, has been favorable. Prime Minister Macmillan has said that this is a team with which he can work very well. I take it from what you've said that between you and Macmillan there's no difference on cooperating with Kennedy and his cabinet? No, oh, absolutely not, no. I mean, if we were in power today, we should certainly be very pleased with the team. And there's no doubt at all that we would cooperate very well with them. Thank you, Mr. Gatesco. The Senate Armed Services Committee took a second and closer look today at a trust fund set up by Robert McNamara, who was designated Kennedy Defense Secretary. After the session, McNamara told reporters he would change his trust fund agreement anyway the Senate suggested to avoid possible conflict of interest. One of President Eisenhower's final official acts as chief executive was the signing of a treaty today with Canada. It calls for the development of the Columbia River Basin in the Northeast, in the Northwest rather, and is the basis for the eventual spending of billions of dollars over the next half century or so. In Sheldon, Iowa, a town of some 4,300 persons, the question tonight is where did uh, two million or more dollars go? It's missing from the Sheldon National Bank and federal authorities say the bank president's daughter, a quiet, well-liked Mrs. Bernice Geiger, has admitted embezzling it over a long period of time. Vice President Richard Nixon added a touch of humor today to his farewell appearance as presiding officer of the Senate. He announced that he is presenting to the chamber two three-minute uh, sand glasses that will enable his successor, Lyndon Johnson, to keep accurate time on the speakers. The Senate has a three-minute rule for speakers during what is called the morning hour. In deadpan fashion, Nixon told his colleagues, a major problem of the presiding officer is to enforce the three-minute rule. 
taking note that Senator Mike Mansfield, the new majority leader, has announced he wants it stringently uh, enforced. Nixon recalled that Senator Francis Case had suggested an hourglass similar to those used by the ancient Greeks, but he concluded that wouldn't be practical to measure short stints. Nixon said he explored the situation and purchased not one, but two three-minute glasses. Well, now, here are some of the things the president uh, said tonight. Like every other citizen, I wish the new president and all who labor with him Godspeed. I pray that the coming years will be blessed with peace and prosperity for all. We now stand 10 years past the midpoint of a century that has witnessed four major wars among great nations. Despite these holocausts, America is today the strongest, the most influential, and most productive nation in the world. Crises there will continue to be in meeting them, whether foreign or domestic, great or small, there is a recurring temptation to feel that some spectacular and costly action could become the miraculous solution to all current difficulties. But each proposal must be weighed in the light of a broader consideration. A closing note or two on the critical housing situation in Washington as Inauguration Day draws near. Hotel space was reserved long ago. The inaugural housing committee alone has placed more than 15,000 persons in hotels, motels, apartments, and private homes. It has at least 500 unsatisfied requests and is operating on a referral basis. The reported vacancies are being listed for applicants uh, to check out for themselves. There were some motel rooms reported available, but officials cautioned that latecomers had better be prepared to go the 40 miles or so to Baltimore or to Annapolis for their accommodations. For weeks now, Washingtonians have been getting calls from friends asking, is your guest room filled? Congressmen have been getting calls for help, too, from constituents back home. Some old-timers said they'd never encountered anything like the demand for tickets and housing. Already the railroad terminals are getting crowded and the so-called Pullman cities are mushrooming in two railroad yards. Approximately 5,000 persons will be staying in their sleeping cars, including 1,800 cadets from West Point and 500 men of the U.S. Coast Guard Academy. More than 7,000 military personnel will have to be housed, but military officials say they can handle it. Summer ROTC areas at various stations in and around Washington have been open to provide room. The 1,800-man wing from the Air Force Academy will stay at Fort Meade and the Merchant Marine Academy, and band will be at the Anacostia Naval Station. The midshipmen from the U.S. Naval Academy are coming by bus from Annapolis, 40 miles away. The big family of President-elect John F. Kennedy settled its problems by leasing houses in the Georgetown section of Washington. Mr. and Mrs. John F. Kennedy themselves and Carolyn and young John uh, have no problem. When they leave their Georgetown home Friday morning, the White House will be waiting for them in the afternoon. Earlier in this program, you heard from Washington what President Eisenhower himself described as his last good night to the American people as president. On Friday, our oldest president will be succeeded by our youngest when John Kennedy takes the oath of office and delivers his first speech to the American people as president. Douglas Edwards reporting from New York. This is the CBS Television Network.